Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And like the t-shirt says, and is the theme of today's show, always be yourself, unless you can be Batman, then be Batman. Also, here is John Schnepp. Thank you, General Leia. How's it going? <laughs> hey, hey, Long Beach people, come on down to the convention. Uh, me and Holly are going to be there. So we're at the Long Beach Comic Con, and we're doing a Heroes panel. So I just want to say that up top, get your tickets now for Long Beach Comic Con. We're going to have a booth there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also, here's Christian Harloff. Let's start movie talk. <laughs> That's all I can do. What was that? Was that? Oh, you were being Batman. I'm proud of you. Thank that sounded you. a little That's bit like Mike Tyson. I like that. I'm not wearing hockey pants. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Better? <laughs> Hey guys, listen, as happens sometimes, something drops just before we start the show, and today that happened. The first teaser trailer for the horror sequel, Annabelle, dropped. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, when I first saw that it dropped, I saw it was one minute. I thought, ah, it's just going to be one of these throwaway, it's just going to be black screen with some titles, and, and it'll say coming soon, Shout whatever. the dollars. Especially since it was only one minute long. But there's more to this trailer than I thought there would be. <laughs> Look, the first Annabelle movie I thought was a lost opportunity because I, that that first Annabelle, the, the first the time we itself, met yeah, Annabelle sure. in The Conjuring, and then I heard they're going to do a standalone movie of it, I thought this is going to be bonkers. This is going to be awesome. And they dropped the ball on it, I, I felt. But I still feel like the potential is there with that frickin' doll. I still feel like the potential is there. And we got our first look at the first teaser. And well, it's again, it's just a trailer. That's all it is. But I gotta tell you, I thought the trailer was executed pretty damn well from the visuals, from the sound effects, all that kind of stuff. Creep me out a bit. So job well done as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. anyway, Christian, what did you think about it? It's a creepy trailer for sure. And I think what, what they I think that even the filmmakers involved knew that they had a missed opportunity. I think this is their kind of mulligan to do it. I think that they realized that it was it didn't come out the way they wanted it to. This trailer and look like myself and Dennis say all the time we're, we're not the audience for the, the heart but you also have to acknowledge when a when a teaser trailer does its job well as far as getting people interested who are a fan of this genre and it's a creepy creepy trailer so yeah it's it's we're buying it I'll buy it General Leia you just watched it with us as well yes, what sir. did you think um the first Annabelle I kind of really had high hopes for because I, I know that the director I think his name was John R Leonetti or Leonati or something like that and he worked on um, the conjuring and if James Wan trusts someone like right. then I have yeah. faith in them but I was really let down by it I still want to see more Annabelle I don't know why but um, I'm intrigued by this um, minute that we got and that little girl she just needs to go see the chiropractor snap <laughs> 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 what do you think about it yeah creepy town I loved it I love uh, I love inanimate objects coming to life especially when they have like bizarre uh, bone chiropractic problems like <laughs> you know and I'm really glad that they didn't really show anything like they kept just cutting away to the woman seeing some the kind mom. of transformation happening off yeah. screen. I got really high hopes for this and I'm extra jacked now because I love Lights Out and it's the same director. Mm. Also another James Wan pick, uh, you know, James Wan produced Lights Out from that short mm. film. And man, we saw Lights Out together. Oh yeah, so we had much a good time. Fun. What a good, fun horror film. So I'm, I've got my expectations high. This trailer did not disappoint me. I really loved it. I was laughing by the end of it. You know, <laughs> I'm like, they're not going to show what's happening. I don't care. It's, something's going on with that kid. The doll's there. I'm in. So. Yeah, you have to picture this for a second. Schnepp and I, like I said, we went to go see Lights Out, but it wasn't just the two of us. Poor little Wendy Lee, who is <laughs> back there, she went with us. And if you if you can picture this, you got on one chair John Schnepp, you got two chairs over me, two guys north of 220 pounds, and then Wendy Lee <laughs> sitting right in the middle. It was like, yeah. and it was scrunched in there. And she was like, stop gesticulating, because we're like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> come on, why are you, get out of there. The lights would go out, we're like, why are they still in the house? I mean, you know. It's one of those uh, you yell at the movie type of thing, just like don't breathe. There's a know? lot of invading of Wendy Lee's personal space right. during that movie. Goes, yeah. Yeah. A lot of She's elbows. Like movie, yeah, you know? sorry, Wendy. <laughs> you handled it like a champ, though. You I tried. It. I tried. I threw some elbows on my own. That's she right. did. She has sharp, yeah. little elbows. That's right. <laughs> no mistake. Well, that Civil War <laughs> video is any indication. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Don't mess, right? All right, let's get on with our first official yeah. story of the day. Zack Snyder took to Twitter yesterday in order to not only share with the fans that Justice League is currently in the home stretch of filming, but also to reveal a new look at the Dark Knight from the movie. Courtesy of Snyder himself, Batman's Justice League version of his Batsuit has been revealed in all its armor 
armored, goggle-wearing glory. John, what do you think about Batman's new tactical suit of armor for Justice League? Well, you know, this kind of popped up as we were doing Movie Talk yesterday, right near the tail end of Movie Talk, and we did, uh, Dennis, myself, and you, uh, we did a little fa live Facebook stream talking about it. But I had to I like the look. Now, remember, this is kind of like the Dark Knight battle armor that Bruce Wayne wore in Batman v Superman, right? right? You saw him in that, but you knew that's not gonna be the bat suit for the whole movie. When we look at this and he calls it the tactical armor, right? I got a feeling this is probably something we're gonna see Ben Affleck wearing maybe for uh, maybe five minutes, maybe a 15 minute scene or something. Mm -hmm. I got a feeling that's not going to be the stare because we saw the trailer. Right. And in that trailer, we did not see this outfit. Right. So this is something uh, kind of a little bit on the next level. Schnapp, what do you think? Yeah, my guess is like we've we've heard about all these different like uh, giant vehicles that the Just League is going to are they're going to be piloting. My guess is also Alfred's going to be involved, like maybe using the Flying Fox. That's one of the code names for one of the vehicles. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think he looks a lot like Night Owl. We've been told we were talking about the design of the new cowl and the hood, the way the ears point inward towards the goggles. The goggles, the actual shape of them are very much Night Owl from Watchmen, which Snyder also did, which isn't a bad thing because Night Owl's based on the, you know, a composite version, version of, Batman. of Batman. So it just it makes sense. Um, I like the suit. I think it looks cool. It definitely has that bale kind of like, you know, modular uh, armored kind of look to it. Can't wait to see it in action. Christian. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It definitely reminded me a lot of the Nolan suit for sure. But I, I think we'll see it a little bit more than maybe five minutes. But I think it's it's going to be one of the suits that we see. And I think you should see one with a little bit more armor to it because there's more at stake coming up mm. in this Justice League film. So there's more that he's going to be going up against it because the guy is not a metahuman, you know, and he's right. going to need to put together some suits that can with, with, with make sure that he can fight against the metahuman. So to me... Uh, I like it. I like what we're seeing, and I like I like the look of everything I've seen so far. Batman. I got a feeling this Batman, much like Christian Bale's, I believe he probably yes, he's got the main Batman suit in that big, I don't know, standing concrete coffin for lack of a better word <laughs> that he has down in the back. So but, that he could just look at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look at it and grimace. <laughs> but I got the feeling that this Batman probably has six or seven outfits that he depending on what his mission is that particular mm -hmm. night if he wants stealth he probably goes something a little more low prep if he knows he's going into combat or a tactical situation maybe something like this to me it's always a matter of does it look like batman mm -hmm. and when i look at it looks like batman yeah. looks good to me all right what's next shane black's 2013 film iron man 3 is arguably one of marvel's most original entries in their shared universe and now according to rebecca hall it could have been even more so hall was speaking to the toronto sun at this year's tiff where she confirmed her role was originally supposed to be the villain instead of guy pierce's aldrich killian but was cut down because of marvel's fear of not selling toys hall said I signed on to do something that was a substantial role. She wasn't entirely the villain. There have been several phases of this, but I signed on to do something very different to what I ended up doing. Halfway through shooting, they were basically like, what would you think if you just got shot out of nowhere? I was meant to be in the movie until the end. I grappled with them for a while and then said, well, you have to give me a decent death scene and you have to give me one more scene with Iron Man, which Robert Downey Jr. supported me on. Christian, what do you think about Marvel ultimately cutting down Rebecca Hall's part in Iron Man 3? Um, I kind of, I was a little bummed by it because I think I would like to, see, I don't think you needed to do all three of the bad guys. You got hurt kind of twist at the end you got the fake mandarin with ben kingsley and then you have you know guy pierce i think maybe you could have condensed it a little bit and the fact that it, the thing that bummed me out the most was because it was to sell toys i think that if if it was well because we thought for this particular story it just serves better but the fact that it was to sell toys i mean i don't know if they had a better if the story could have been better with her as the villain then i would have liked to have seen that but we'll never know because we i don't know what the the full plan was i think she's a very talented actress i would have liked to have seen her she, that that part of the movie did feel a little tele, telegraphed that that it was coming towards the end that she was going to do do the turn so maybe that it felt a little thrown in there and it seems from her comments that it was kind of thrown in there out of nowhere but look for me i i've said it for iron man 3 my my opinion in it, on it is this as a marvel film i don't think it works as a shane black film i think it works very well but for what they were doing in this in this comments for the marvel film i would have liked to seen what rebecca hall could have done as the villain schnapp yeah you know i really like iron man 3 and hearing this news kind of bummed me out because I don't think I, I kind of read it a different way. I thought she was saying that 
That meant the Guy Pierce character would not have been the Mandarin revealed as a Mandarin. She would have been right. the Mandarin, and Guy Pierce would have just been like you know a low level techie oh, who was working his way up, mm -hmm. worked his way through AIM, who was working with her. I I thought that. I'd love to get my hands on that script before they change it and see what it really is all about. But I mean, reading these comments, definitely it is kind of a bummer to, you know, but it's also kind of a cool thing to know that how much has changed within just the last like six, seven years. Like now we're like, no, it's actually cool to have female characters like right. Ray from Star Wars or or Black Widow or Scarlet Witch from the Marvel films. Or you know, now we have Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman like as main lead characters. I think it's important to like just acknowledge that like, yeah, I mean, I guess with Iron Man 3 and Marvel freaking out about toys, just like DC or any of these companies, they want that's the goal is to sell these figures. You got a brand new Batman tactical suit. That's another action figure. That's another hot toys for us adults who want to buy like a different thing. I mean, it's about that. So, I mean, I get it. I think that the fear that they elicited and changed the entire script because of the fear of selling toys has now been removed because of, hey, look, look at the sell through of all these other characters. And women, as an audience member, has increased and they're buying these products too. So I don't look at it as a, a, as a bad thing. I think it's like we've, we've moved forward since back then, but too bad that happened then. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of with you on the fact that I actually, I enjoyed Iron Man 3 for what it was, but you're right, it was very out of step with the rest of the Marvel Universe, and, and I understand why a lot of people who dislike Iron Man 3 did. But here's the interesting thing about this particular story, is that really this is more interesting on a principle level than it is on a practical. From a principle level, yeah, it is unfortunate. I mean, we shouldn't be caught by surprise, but it is unfortunate that just a couple of years ago, and it's probably still happening, to, happening today, although I think on a little bit of a smaller scale than it did, thankfully. But like, we changed this movie because we didn't think that a, a female villain here would push the movie to the point that kids would buy the toys and all that kind of stuff, and they made a creative decision based on that. We shouldn't be surprised on that. This has been happening since the original Star Wars mm -hmm. in 77. Right. So that's not surprising. But from a practical point of view, I don't really know that it would have changed much. I mean, ultimately, you still had a fake Mandarin, right? right? You still had, and a lot of people, I remember in those early days when Iron Man 3 first came out, the reveal of the Ben Kingsley character, that pissed a lot of people off. To me, it was a cool twist, but I totally understood where everybody else was saying, dude, no, that was a bait and switch. We felt like we've been bait and switched and we didn't like it. Especially the way they pitched it in the trailers. Yes, right. they, yeah. especially the way they pitched it. You'll never see. Yeah, it was I great. great. But I love, I love the bait and switch because it was so refreshingly, like, it was different. I liked I'm it too. I'm yeah. shocked that you liked it just because of how the Mandarin could have been. I mean, now that they've kind of announced that he was, there, there's still, the Mandarin still is out there. We right. didn't know that at the time. Right. So for me, I kind of thought they wasted the character. But again, looking at it at a Shane Black point of view, you're like, that's a fun kind of crazy twist. But I just thought it was, especially the fact that they haven't had some really good concrete villains that I felt that they kind of lost that opportunity with the Mandarin. Do you think, now we all know of course that a little bit later they did that Marvel one shot where right. they do more than suggest, they outright say, right. no actually out there there is a real Mandarin who's mm -hmm. not happy his name was usurped. Right. Do you think ever, let me, let me set an over and under, over and under 35%. The chance that Marvel will actually ever touch upon again the real Mandarin. You want thirty-five percent over or under? Ever? Say within the next five years. Over. Over thirty-five percent. Yeah, wait. I'd say over seventy-five percent. I want it to be hundred percent, but I think it's under. I don't think they're ever going to go back to it. I think, but you're over thirty-five. Oh, you're saying never. No, I, I'll go under. I under. want to be at hundred, but I'm going to go under thirty. I think wow. the Ten Rings network. Right. That's that network of uh, you know weapons manufacturing. Yeah. I think it's very easy for them to team up. I agree. I hope they do it. Aim. They could team that up with Hydra. They could have a giant force, and that's an easy way to introduce the Mandarin. Easy way to introduce Modok, a whole bunch of these other weird side villains. I mean, if you've read the comics, you know that there's no way they could have done the Mandarin in Iron Man three. So that's like when right. when I when I realized oh they're doing a bait and switch watching the movie, I laughed. I liked it because the Mandarin, the comics, and a Mandarin the way they were setting it up, it was it would have been quite different. So I, I think you know we'll get that Mandarin more so from the comics, but maybe not as uh, as specific. I, I gotta say I know it it. Uh, and I understand why I pissed a lot of people off, but that scene after it's revealed that he's a fake, that scene when he's sitting there in his room 
talking with Tony Stark. I thought that was really funny. I got, yeah. I got a big kick out of the scene. All right, folks, listen, it is Thursday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week. Now, on Tuesday, we talked about one of the wide release films, and that's The Blair Witch, mm -hmm. but we got two other films opening up this week. Ashley, what do we have? First up is Snowden in 2013. NSA contractor Edward Snowden leaked a large number of classified documents to the media, exposing the U.S. government's covert surveillance activities. Also coming out is Bridget Jones' Baby. Breaking up with Mark Darcy leaves Bridget Jones over 40 and single again. Feeling that she has everything under control, Jones decides to focus on her career as a top news producer. Suddenly, her love life comes back from the dead when she meets a dashing and handsome American named Jack. Things couldn't be better until Bridget discovers that she is pregnant. Well, with Snowden, personally, I'm fascinated by it because... Look, I, and I'm not going to pretend to know all the details. I don't. So maybe there are other details that would change my opinion. I'm just like everybody else. I, I know what I know from watching the news and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, I was one of those people, and I know there are people on the other side of the fence. I really applauded what Snowden did. I mean, the American government works for the American people. And if they're going to spy on the American people, that should only be done by the consent, consent of the American people. And the fact that he kind of blew the whistle on that... I think it was important, and I would love to see a little bit more, even if it's in a dramatic way, I'd love to see how that whole thing came about and played out. So I'd be fascinated by that. Bridget Jones' baby, I skipped the press screening for it. I have not been interested in it, and yet the people I know who have seen it are telling me it's a really good, entertaining, fun movie. So now my interest is completely peaked. I'm going to go see it this weekend for sure anyway. Christian Snowden. Bridget Jones' baby, which one has your attention? Well, I saw Snowden, and I know, and I also missed the press screening because I also know that my wife wants to see Bridget Jones' Diary, and I don't want to see it twice. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to make sure that I do want to see it once because, like you, I've heard some really good things about it. So I'm very curious about that one because I did like the first movie. Hmm. Did not like the second one, but the first one was okay. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. And to be honest, we don't get a lot of um, good romantic comedies these days. There just haven't been as many. That's true. So I'm, I'm interested with that one. Now, Snowden was something I was very interested in for a lot of the reasons that you said. I knew what was happening, but I wanted to see how, especially Oliver Stone, who is the king of controversy, and he want, and I, JFK, I think, is great. Yes, there's a lot of things that he kind of maybe blew up a little bit more in that, in that film, but the thing with JFK, I was on the edge of my seat for the entire movie, and it was a three-hour movie. This one, it plods on for a while. It's about 2.15, 2.20. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Shailene Woodley have amazing chemistry in the movie, but it just, and I don't want this, I don't need this movie to be born identity, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted it to be a little bit more exciting, and I'm not talking about action mm. scenes, just I just wanted, I wanted to be pulled in a little bit more you than I was. You wanted the tension to be there. I wanted the tension to be there. There were a couple of things that happened throughout. I'm like, okay, and then it just, I don't know, it just takes a little while to really get hooked, but I think the reason that you do care is because of Levitt, but I will also say that, and, and Oliver Stone always does this, he takes one side. It's never really black and white. It's right. one side, and he portrays Snowden as a hero. Schnapp, which of these two are you looking forward to? Uh, Snowden, for me, I mean, I think the Snowden in real life is, a, is an American hero, and the way he's being treated right now is horrible. So I definitely want to see what Oliver Stone's take is on it. Obviously, it's going to be you know, colored you know, Oliver Stone's rose tinted glasses. But, you know, if, if you've read up on Snowden, you've, you know what he's done. He's done a great service for the freedoms of Americans. So, I mean, that's the most important film to me that's coming out. Bridget Jones, uh, Baby, I have zero interest in seeing it. I didn't see the other two. So this trilogy will uh, have to remain until I could watch all three on Netflix or something. I don't know. <laughs> Commentaries. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, we reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run the down, then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? A new trailer has been released for Disney's latest animated adventure, Moana. The movie comes from the Oscar-nominated writer-director duo of Ron Clements and John Musker and features the voice work of newcomer Aulili Carvalho opposite Dwayne Johnson in a story about an adventurous teenager who sails out on a daring mission to save her people. Moana lands in theaters on November 23, 2016. Schnett Byers saw the new trailer for Moana. I buy it. I, I like uh, this this new animation style that Disney is, has employed. The the character faces have a slightly more realistic look to them. Everything's modeled in a, a, a very different way than any of the other Disney animated, 3D animated films that I've seen. And the character designs for the, both characters are really refreshing and fun. They're different. Dwayne Johnson's character is very extra thick, kind of like yeah. almost like the Hulk, or like but you know, but kind of like lovable, a giant galoot. And, yeah. and the 
the back and forth play between them almost felt like it was the Wonder Twins. Like one could turn into a bucket of water, the other's a giant sword. <laughs> but anyway, it looked like a lot of fun. So, I mean, I, I think the trailer sold me on it, whereas when I first heard about it, I wasn't really too interested in either way. Now that I've seen this trailer, I want to see the film. Christian. Yeah, it's a big buy for me. Disney's really been knocking it out of the park, whether it's Big Hero 6 or mm -hmm. with Frozen, um, Zootopia. This is another one, and they talked. They brought this out for D twenty three a couple of years ago. I think, yeah, now. and it, they, I had my interest then, but there's really no footage, just the story alone. And now to see it come to life in this trailer, it, it looks pretty. Like you're saying, the new style of animation, the, it, it looks fun. It looks like it's going to be. It, and I actually reminded me a little bit of Kubo, which I just saw mm. recently too. It's just like that kind of journey that they're going on. Totally. So I'm really excited for this movie. You know, I have not been looking forward to this movie. To me, it's kind of, I don't know why, but it's had the feel of like Princess and the Frog, mm. which didn't really click for me either on that level. Um, but mine changed. Big buy for me on this trailer, because if a trailer can take you from not being interested in the movie to being really excited for the movie, that's what you got to do, and that's what this trailer did. I thought the trailer, the, the tone of the humor in it was charming. I was laughing at all the little yeah. visual gags mm -hmm. and whatever. Like that one shot where she's like, this is my boat, and you're going to think, just grabs her, throws her off the boat. Like I, I was chuckling out loud. And even the end when he jumps in, he's like, I'm still falling. I'm still yeah. falling. Yeah. And, you, and, you know, and I didn't know what I thought about the character design, stuff like that, but he's a demigod and all that kind of stuff. I didn't know if the voice of The Rock was going to take me out of it because he's The Rock. I mean, he's so... But you know what? 30 seconds in the trailer, I totally. was in. I was just totally in with it. And, you know, I'm really excited, too. When I found out that Lin-Manuel Miranda from, from Hamilton is doing the music in this stuff, too, I thought, you know what? This could be really, really special. And so the trailer's got me on board. For me, it's a big buy. All right, what's next? James Gunn took, took his huge production of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 to Comic-Con 2016, and in doing so, revealed that Kurt Russell was Star-Lord's father. Now Kurt Russell is opening up a bit about the movie and the story he's calling grounded and complex. Speaking with Collider Steve Weintraub at TIFF 2016, Russell said, I was impressed with the stuff that I saw at Comic-Con, but they didn't show you everything. It's a very complex story, and they really get into it. This is going to be one of the more, probably for Marvel, it's more connected to human issues, family issues, parental issues, and issues that sons and daughters have with their moms and dads and their family tree, where they come from. I just think it's going to be an interesting Peter's character in this one. He's got dilemmas and he's got decisions to make that are not just about whether to save that thing or that person. This is about finding who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. John Byersell, Kurt Russell's comments about a complex family story in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy them big because what I'm really getting excited about, we heard Chris, for, Chris Pratt the other day say that this could be the most, what, what did he say? Um, was it, not, not epic, he called it biggest spectacle movie yeah. of all time. And then you hear Kurt Russell talk about we're going to have real family connection issues and stuff like that. I, I get, I'm a sucker for those types of themes in movies, I really am. And I was speaking to somebody from Disney yesterday and what they told me was that around the offices there, this Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is a film they've got in the pipe right now that they are most excited wow. about. Um, so I, if, if it's possible to take my anticipation and excitement level for Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> 2 any higher, I guess it just did. No, I love these comments because it's not just spectacle. It's going to have the human touch as well. And that's when you get into some real special filmmaking and seeing Kurt Russell in this world, playing this role, playing against Chris Pratt. I think this is going to be a really great pairing on screen. So for me, huge buy. Schnepp. Yeah, big buy for me too. I mean, Star Lord's dad is a living planet. I mean, who, <laughs> that's insanity. But yet, you know now that it's like it's Kurt Russell. They're gonna have a back and forth. It's gonna be a, a very much like Ant Man. It's gonna be about family. And I think, I mean, I like James Gunn's uh, everything he's been le leaking about the story. It's like he's keeping it with the gu he's keeping it like a small family unit and not getting too big. That's why I think he was saying, look, you're not gonna see stones in this movie like the, the Infinity Stones. You're not gonna see. We're gonna keep this on track and make it a Guardians, just like the first first film make it a guardians film so i love what uh russell said too i think it's uh, it sounds awesome i can't wait another seven months or how how many more months do we have to wait yeah <laughs> too, like, many. Uh, too many too many uh it's a huge buy because it keeps in check what they started with in guardians one in the very beginning that first scene with, with star lord and his and his mother and mm. they mentioned the father and they sprinkle in kind of here and there who was his dad and we started asking questions afterwards who is his dad 
And it's not just a matter of, oh, there's your dad. Thanks a lot. Okay, it's Kurt Russell. He's right. buying it. Well, let's go fight and make a big spectacle movie. It's more exploring that. And to hear his comments that it's going to be about the family unit and fathers and sons and these types of things, isn't that what you want? I mean, isn't that what makes a good movie? Isn't that like you're going to care more about the characters? You're going to be invested more in their timelines and what they what they do. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a really smart thing for them to do. It just shows what James Gunn does as a storyteller. And the fact that here's what I got to set you up for. Now I'm going to give you a nice little punch with the family stuff. So I, I really buy what Kurt Russell is saying. All right, what's next? The first trailer has been released for Europa Corps' new political thriller, Miss Sloan, starring Jessica Chastain. The movie is directed by Shakespeare and Love's John Madden, with Chastain playing a resolute and unrelenting DC lobbyist who puts her career and possibly her life at risk when she decides to head up a gun control campaign. The film is set to open in theaters on December 9th. Christian, buy or sell the new trailer for Miss Sloan, starring Jessica Chastain. I do buy this trailer, and I think that this we know that this trailer and this movie is going to cause a lot of talk once it comes out and reading her interviews or what she, what she was saying as far as this movie's more a, a very not similar to what we were just talking about with Oliver Stone to where he's got a you know black and white one sided you know exactly one sided right. as far as this movie that's not you might think right away that it's oh it's just going to be this one point of view it's not it's about what this woman did how how she does it and what I think I liked about the trailer is the way that Jessica Chastain is just front and center here this is the type of movie we all know her. We all a lot, there are some people like that that know her name. There are some that definitely recognize her right away. This is the type of movie that puts her in the front and center to say, "Okay, this is the star." Yes, she had Zero Dark Thirty. Yes, she won an Oscar. But this is the this is something about her to where she's just going to do more roles like this. She is that powerful of an actress that she's going to do this and get you into what, whatever your stance is on the situation. I think that she's the type of actress that can just put a, a perspective on this once the movie comes out. So I buy it. Schnapp. Yeah, I buy it. I mean, I wasn't as interested in the trailer. I mean, I, I feel like I, I need to see another trailer. This was like one of those intro trailers, but I think she's a great actress, like you were saying, and I'm glad to see her returning to more substantial uh, roles other than like the Huntsman's, her flipping some a axes and stuff. I almost totally feel like that's that. wasting her <laughs> talent totally to, to be uh, honest about it. So it's nice to see her front and center again. So I buy the trailer. You know, Jessica Chastain, I'm a, I'm a little bit in love with Jessica yeah. Chastain. And she hasn't won an award, but she was nominated for two Academy Awards. Nominated, one right. for Zero Dark Thirty, one, right. for, um, one for The Help, actually, which is mm. a magnificent film. That's the movie that I kind of fell in love with her a little bit. I thought she was just spectacular on that. And, you know, this movie's got, like, besides her, it's got Sam Watterson, who, for the life of me, from Law & Order fame... I don't know why more movies haven't used this guy. Sure. I think this dude is just a magnetic presence on screen. Jonathan Lithgow, blah, blah, blah. And I sell the trailer. Mm -hmm. I think the movie's actually going to be really good. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see it. But I'm not excited to see because of this trailer. I think this trailer actually did a pretty poor job getting me hooked into what the drama is going to be. And just putting Jessica Chastain's face on there, well, enough to get my attention, is not enough to make me more excited for the movie just, just because. Show me what she's doing more. And I didn't like the format they used about her, you know, cutting back and forth between her just staring at the camera, kind of narrating a bit, off to something else, back to her. It's a technique that just didn't work right. for me. So while I'm looking forward to the movie, and I think the movie's going to be probably lights out, I, the trailer itself didn't work for me, so I got to give it a sell. All right, guys. Well, listen, Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video here today. We got a couple of really cool videos coming up here today. First of all, of course, is Christian Harloff hosting us on Jedi Council. That goes up at 5 p.m. today. 5 Who's on the council today? Well, it'll be me, yourself, Tiffany Smith, and Mark Ellis. So it's going to be the regular crew today. Always exciting to talk about Star Wars stuff. Once again, that goes up at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Also, yesterday... We did this little thing. We did a commentary for this little indie film that came out earlier this year called Captain America Civil War. That goes online today at 2 p.m. to commemorate the release of the, the uh, Blu-ray. And, of course, it came out on digital before. So check, once again, at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for Captain America Civil War commentary that we do. That drops at 2 p.m. And make sure you check out the Schmodown tomorrow with between Christian Harloff, John Rocha, and uh, myself and Freddie Prince Jr. judging and calling the match. Should be a lot of fun. Yeah, there's two things there. There he is. Uh, I I'm telling you, if the my amount of texts I'm getting from this loudmouth uh, every every day, I'm looking to shut him up. But I also say, Freddie Prince Jr. and Sam Witwer, we can happily announce that that match will be taking place this Tuesday. Wow. We have now normally the team thing is going to happen there, but we're moving we're moving the team around just for a week. So Freddie Prince Jr. and Sam Witwer, that's Tuesday. That's going to be Bam. an awful lot of fun. Well, listen, guys, we do this show live here every day, Monday through Friday, and since we're doing it live, you guys who are watching us. 
You can make sure you jump on Twitter, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video, and you can start tweeting in some live questions because we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take those from you. Send them on in to Wendy. Wendy's going to be keeping her eye open for them, and we'll get to those in just a few minutes. But for now, let's get to the mailbag. Ashley, what do we got? Pawan Kadam writes, as John and John noted on yesterday's mailbag, that conglomeration of studios and diversification of characters is the new trend for comic book movies. Do you think Warner Brothers would be willing to share their roster of DC comic characters with Universal or Paramount the same way Disney and Sony are doing it with Spider-Man. Well, it's the the first thing that's really important to keep in mind here. Marvel never shared crap. Marvel never woke up and said, you know what? We have so many characters. You can Let's have this. What about this? Here's a little slice <laughs> right. for you. Oh, do you want a character? Yeah. That's yeah that's sold them. Hey, Christmas. Here's yeah. Spider-Man. Yeah. There was no sharing going Savagely on. Savagely bought and appropriated. Yeah. Right. But what happened yeah. was, if you remember the history, the context is extremely important here. At the time, Marvel was about to go under. I yep. mean, Marvel was facing bankruptcy. They needed to raise capital. And what they did was they sold off the movie rights to a whole bunch of the characters. Something that saved the company. But I'm sure in hindsight, they kind of wish there was another way around it because they would love to have all the characters under one roof. Mm -hmm. um, so look, from a fan point of view, yeah, I would be excited to hear that Warner Brothers in DC sold movie rights to studios like Paramount or Universal to allow different flavors, different tones, different kinds of characters that maybe Warner Brothers in DC would never do, but they'll let, but another studio would do. I'd be excited about that. You know, we mentioned on Movie Talk yesterday, think of it this way. If Marvel had never sold off the X-Men, you know, uh, roster of characters, that Deadpool movie we got at the beginning of this year that was so awesome, never would have happened. Never would have happened in a million years if that didn't happen. So I would love it, but Warner Brothers is in a very different position than Marvel was back when they had to sell off their stuff. And I think Marvel sees, I think DC, I mean, sees Marvel wishing they had never given up their characters. Yeah, totally. And I don't think they're ever, Warner Brothers and DC are thinking five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. It's like, hey, maybe we don't want to do a Lobo movie right now, but we might want to do one in a few years, so let's keep all of our eggs together. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it'll happen. Schnapp, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely not. In fact, I think, that's one of the cool things about the Warner Brothers DC universe is that they own all their own characters. So yeah. that they're they're setting out movie versions of their characters. They've set up television versions of their characters, yeah. both live action and animated. And they can decide whether or not they want to have them work together in the same universe or be in parallel universes. It's all up to that same company as opposed to like, oh, well, we don't have Firestorm because he's over at CBS. We don't have Batman because he's on ABC and, you know, Paramount owns Batman that we'll, we'll never be able to make a Just League the way we'd want to make. They don't have those problems. They don't have any of those issues. And I think that's a plus as far as the DC Cinematic Universe and all of their universes, their television universe, their animated universe. It's a one cohesive world if they want to. And if they want to do a one-off, they can do that. Just like they're, you know, you talk about Booster Gold. Ah, it might not be connected. It's a one-off. It might be shot documentary style. We don't know, but we're going to try that. With Marvel, they don't have that ability to do that. We want to try something with X-Men. You can't. You can't even use the word mutant. You got to use vibranium. You can't use adamantium. Right. The entire universes and the characters from the comics have been, like, separated because of legalities and selling off your characters. That's the pl the plus side, I think, of the WB DC universe. So I would love for that not to happen. And as you've seen, Marvel has just been like, "Give us up, give us the characters back, give them <laughs> back." Okay, we'll make a deal with you. Everybody's playing nice because the Marvel Cinematic Universe is so successful. I think Sony was very smart to bring Spider-Man back into that fold, but still be able to hold on to him. I think you'll see that with some other things. You're not going to see that with X-Men. I guess not in our lifetime. Christian, while it, it seems like it's improbable that DC would ever do it as a film fan is it something you'd be interested in seeing like maybe a paramount or universal getting the hands on a couple of these characters not really no because i think it, it just goes against the whole vision of what they're trying to do right now mm. with the universe and it's, but it's like it's i think what it would also say is very similar to like when we saw sony give away well not give away but make the deal with spider-man right. it's because we all knew there's a lot of problems there and they need to make a fix by saying and to, like Marvel when they first gave up Spider-Man in the first place Sony was facing financial problems right, right. and we had a, their back against exactly. the wall exactly so if Warner Brothers was like hey Paramount you guys want to make a movie because we don't really know how to make this one and we were there's a lot of skeptics already on the DC Cinematic Universe what would that do oh they don't trust in their own team so mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to see that I want to see them doing what they're doing because I've look Man of Steel right now 
for me out of the three movies is my favorite movie I think there's a lot of potential I think they have a lot of great filmmakers out there that are working on the next couple of movies and I'm very excited for Wonder Woman I'm very excited um, for Justice League and Aquaman and all these movies that are coming out so stick within what they're doing and Schnepp, everything that you said as far as they have it all already it's all theirs they know it they have they came up with their plan and they've been working on this for years they have DC and they're like when I was at Warner Brothers they were trying to figure out ways to do these movies and Wonder Woman they were trying to work on it with Joss Whedon before the Marvel Cinematic Universe blew up the way I see Marvel is we just watched Civil War um, yesterday yeah. together and Marvel was uh, Ant-Man very small yeah, and now they're the they're big giant, giant yeah. throwing around <laughs> wherever it's coming in. Oh, all right, Fantastic Four, yeah. get it back Those and laughing like Paul Rudd. Oh, 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 that's oh, really, that's yeah, who really, they are really. at this moment, yeah. and they can do that. So they're trying to grab out Fantastic Four, <laughs> grab back wherever they can. Um, yeah. So yeah, I I don't think it's it's necessary. I wouldn't want to see it because I just think it takes away from the validity of what they're trying to do right now. They're they're very young into their universe. They're mm -hmm. baby yes, they steps yeah. into yeah. it. Give them time, and they'll be. I think they're going to be great in the next three to five years. And you know, one of the things you were pointing out, I think the magic word going with everything you were describing, Schnepp, that was so accurate is flexibility. Mm. By holding on to all of their characters, they maintain that flexibility with television, with movies, with whatever they want to do. And then again, they're not just thinking about what can we do next year. They're thinking about what might we want to do 12 years from now. Right. And they want to make sure they maintain that flexibility. All right. Last mailbag question. Daniel Weiss writes, love all you do every day. Thank you for helping my love for pop culture grow every day. Awesome. My friend and I have a bet based on box office results and I would love to know who you think is going to win. Uh oh. He has Rogue One only and I have Moana plus Fantastic Beasts. We are only counting money gross for the film and their first four weeks of release. Who is going to win the bet? Wow. Those are two really good titles right. to put up against. So if you're asking, okay, domestic only in the first their first four weeks of release, because let's say domestic, let's say domestic only because different movies open in a different number of international sure. territories at different times. So that's not a, a fair comparison. So domestically, Rogue One and their first four weeks versus Moana plus Fantastic Beasts in their first four weeks. Very interesting. You know, I'm going to go Moana and Fantastic Beasts. I think, com I mean, Rogue One will make more than either of them, but I think combined, do not underestimate the continuing hunger people have for Harry Potter content. Sure. I mean, I know my wife is losing her mind for Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I know a lot of people are excited about that. And Moana is now looking better and better as a Disney family animated film. Never underestimate that. I got to go with the team of Moana and uh, and Fantastic Beats teaming up and beating Rogue One in first four weeks of domestic release. What do you think? I'm with you, but only by a little bit. Right. Because Rogue, because I think the Fantastic Beats comes out at the end of November. Is that right? The, like, Somewhere I think there. So I think Rogue One's going to actually cut into that four week there. So it, it'll hit it. But I think that the one thing I don't want to go against Darth Vader because Vader's going to get a lot of butts mm -hmm. in the seats but like you mentioned the, the Disney movie and the family movie and that's the one although I don't know because the Sing also comes out and there's a lot of buzz with Sing yeah so, I'll, I'll take the team just by a little bit but if Rogue One beat them both by themselves I wouldn't be surprised I'm going gonna, gonna to go against both you guys I'm going to flex with Rogue One yeah. I think because I was like adding up I was like Rogue One's first weekend just say it's 150 just let's say it's 150 million I think it, that's safe. Yeah, it's a that's a safe bet. It could go 200. We don't know, you know, especially as the the hype gets bigger, the Darth Vader gets more real. You see a scene of him walking Repeat around, you see a lightsaber. People yeah. are going to freak out. I'll freak out when I see a Darth Vader lightsaber scene, start crying like a little 10-year-old. So, <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of that's that hype. You're right. Harry Potter, that hype like that's there too. Seeing that new trailer, I was like, "Man, this looks really fun. It's like Harry Potter. You're in the Harry Potter universe, but it's a whole new team of people, whole new storyline. Adults, it's totally different. It's not little kids, you know, going on some magic journey. It's like, oh, now we're in that world, and is this an actual sorcerer? You know what I mean? I haven't read the Fantastic Beast book, so I'm I'm sure it's going to make a lot of money. It's not going to do Rogue One money, and I don't think Moana is going to do. It's going to do great. But even combining that with the four weeks is what where the wind comes for Rogue One. I think Rogue One's 150 opening weekend, if not 200. Second weekend, it's going to be 100, 150, even the second weekend. I think the drop-off will be very minimal because it's opening, what is it, the 21st, I think? or 
Is yeah, it all opening? depends on word of mouth, though. That's, like, your, that's, that's what I'm going. That's what I'm, yeah. yeah, but that's all I'm saying. I think yeah. the the Rogue yeah. One with the callback to the original Star Wars is that's that's heavy. Yeah, so that's true. I just feel yeah. like that that heaviness will be able to beat the the that combo. The other two by a little combined. Bit. It's just yeah. that Disney's just been on such a tear with their with their animation and like and, and yeah. financially on a tear. Like mm -hmm. what Zootopia did and sure. what all these movies have done. And by just, the way, Fantastic Beasts does open in November, uh, right in the middle, near the closer to the end of November. I think November. That's, say, that's why I think it's tough because Rogue it's One tough. will cut into that and then Sing, like I said, cuts into. Well, the Fantastic Beasts will have been already out for its four week run. We'll have had four weeks underneath this belt. But here's yeah. the thing there's a panel in one of the Star Wars comics right now that if this was. Yeah, 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 imagine yeah, this. You put this scene in a trailer for Rogue One, and, and it's not. But if they did, it would break the internet. It would break <laughs> box office websites all around the world. There's this great panel, look it up online, but it's Darth Vader standing in the middle of a battlefield with a lightsaber out, surrounded by about 500 troops, tanks, everything. And you see all these sol rebel soldiers yelling at him, you're surrounded. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the quote, it goes to Darth Vader's face is, I am only surrounded by fear and dead men. Yeah. You mm. put that in that trailer, Ooh. forget it. Yeah. 300 a, million it, opening it's a weekend. Great <laughs> scene. If that's during the Vader down. Wow. Angle, yeah, during the Vader, Vader down angle. They put something like that in this trailer, people will lose their yeah. minds. Anyway, okay, guys, I said we would save a few minutes at the end of the show for your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video. Fire them on in. Wendy's over there. She's our gatekeeper. Wendy, what have you picked out today? Derek Large says, with the rising quality of horror movies this year, do you see the Academy nominating any of them? It, it de depends on for what. Um, look, I think there is an argument to be made for Stephen Lang for supporting actor. I mean, Stephen Lang was just, was just so, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Are any of them like best picture material? I don't know if any of the, the horror movies this year are gonna end up in my, well, there's been many of them that I really, really enjoyed. I don't know if any of them are gonna end up in my personal top five or top 10 of the year. Mm. Um, and if me, more of a genre guy, is not gonna put them in my top five or top 10, I doubt the Academy will, but that doesn't preclude it from maybe some other uh, awards. Like for instance, the, car, the sound design in Conjuring 2 was wonderful. Right. So I wouldn't be surprised if it got a nomination for that. I already mentioned Stephen Lang in uh, Don't Breathe. Um, so sure, for some some of the other awards other than Best Picture, I just don't see it happening for Best Picture. The major awards were just not there yet, as far as the Academy. They just they won't they don't represent genre stuff for a lot of it. I mean, it's very rare. Like everybody went crazy when Lord of the Rings was able to, to do it. Like it's it's a big eleven Oscars. It's a big thing when it happens when genres get recognized and they should be recognized more. It should be, uh, especially this year because this year has been the year of horror movies and good ones. So. I just don't think it's going to happen. Like the, the 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 smaller awards could absolutely happen, but the major awards, the acting, even Stephen Lang, I just don't think it's going to happen. Oh, yeah, it's a stretch. It's, it's a stretch. stretch. It's I'd like to see it happen, um, but it's just I just can't imagine. I don't think that they're there yet. When our generation starts becoming kind of you know front and foremost, the, the ones making the the decisions, sure. I think it's going to start happening a lot more. But right now, it's not going to happen. Schnapp, any chance for uh, some Oscar love for any of the horror movies? This I got to be honest, I don't care. I mean, I, what I'll say it like this: I love the Oscars. But I don't care that genres are not represented that way because we have other awards like the Scream Fest Awards are where horror films should be nominated. And that's where Stephen Lang should win yeah. for mm -hmm. best performance. I think, you know, every genre has their own award system. Science fiction films have uh, the Saturn Awards. There's all these different kinds of award setups that are growing in popularity. And I think it's up to, you know, all the viewers who, you, if you feel your film isn't being represent, re represented by the Oscars, remember the Oscars represents all films that came out. And it's sort of like, especially, you know, here in the States. So it's like, you know, it's like, it's gonna, it's obviously it's gonna be up against a lot of other like topical films, more realistic films, bio films, a whole bunch of different kinds of things. And that's kind of where those Oscars have really been gone, gone to mo most of the time. Like you got a couple of wins, you got the Joker one, you got Lord of the Rings one, you name another one. You can't because it's, na it's not, well, the, it's the, not the genre. The technical or smaller ones, a those lot of the genre count, films though. are. I mean, I, 
They you don't mean count for like me. the big ones. That's all like I'm saying. Best yeah. picture, best yeah, actor, best actor. Yeah, they're gimmies to those, and I get it. But I think you shouldn't think that way. I, I at least personally don't think that way. I love the Oscars, and I love seeing all the different big movies get awarded, that kind of thing. And when I say big movies, it falls into that kind of specific category, more realistic. It's more about the, the craft in that way and not about the genre-specific roles that these other kind of movies perform in. So watch Scream Fest, watch Saturn Awards, we'll go online and find all these different festivals that give out awards to those genres, and those are the ones that you should be embracing. The Golden Globe's got a show as a possibility. Don't ever talk about <laughs> the Golden Globe. Uh, <laughs> Golden Globe. All right, let's take two more. Wendy, what else we got? All right, Jose T. Santana says, with anime films going to live action, can we see Spirited Away or Princess Mononoke as live action? I don't think so, although I would be one of the first people in line to see it. But unfortunately, like those names amongst people in the circles that you guys travel in and we travel in, we recognize those names. If I go stand in front of that AMC Burbank 16 right now and ask 100 people coming out, you know, about either of those titles, probably 95 of them don't don't recognize it and it would probably be a little bit odd. And to be honest, I think those stories are best suited in the animated totally. format. I, I don't know that they would play as well in a live action It's thing, Miyazaki. Which, you don't mess with Miyazaki. Yeah. You don't adapt Miyazaki. You watch Spirited Away. You watch Princess Mononoke the way they're supposed to be watched, animated. Screw that live action shit. Oh, you simple, simple gentlemen. Uh, this is Hollywood. Uh, if this movie, if the other movies I don't do, think it would make money. If the other movies do well, mm. the an animes, then they're going to... Right now, I don't think it's going to be a choice, but... And I'm not saying that it should be, but I'm saying if the other movies that are getting transferred over, yeah, they're going to start, they do, that's what they do. That's what, it's, oh, wait a minute, that was a big hit. What else? Everyone will spirit it away. Look, if, if Studio Ghibli was involved in that's doing the happen. live action, I'm down with it. I don't want to see someone else take it away. It has to be that I still studio. think it would be odd seeing them it live would, action. It would be know? totally really, odd. Don't it would know be they, a, they play well. It, it would be completely weird. But if the studio behind making the original ones was it's like, involved, let's make the adaptation, be more on board. Be 100% yeah. on board. All right, last Twitter question of the day. Bob Linton says, will the DCEU use the Watchtower or Hall of Justice? I don't know. That I'll be honest with you. In the animated world, those seem fine. If, if you're trying to make a more real world example, no, that's it, for the Watchtower is stupid. Uh, as far as in you know, a live action thing would would not float at all. Right. And a Justice League is like, oh, so if the bad guys want to go like blow up Superman, like villains every day would be firing rocket launchers at the Hall of R Justice. The Watchtower, it, it's right there. Yeah, yeah, it would it would make in a live action setting. It makes it works great in the animated world. Would not, I don't think it would make sense in a live action. Let setting. me flip it though. Batman's got his Batcave. Secret. So, so but it's secret. <laughs> but I'm saying. Is I think Superman would have a secret, like he's got the Fortress There's of Solitude. solitude yep. I think they will make a Hall of Justice type watchtower situation that's completely secret. I don't know if it'll be on the dark side of the moon or if it'll be like underground somewhere, but it makes sense. Maybe even with like taking Batman, who's taking the initiative to form the Justice League, he makes a bigger Batcave, and that's the you know the Hall of Justice. I could see that happening, and it's a secret place, but not so. a public place Hell where no. they do public tours no. and you Nothing know have big public. exhibits. No, no, yeah. The only reason I think that the to go away from a hell no is only because of the the events that kind of went down in Batman v Superman. Everything was very public mm. in Batman v Superman. Whether it's that they he's he shows up with the whole Holly Hunter scene and and like everything that that goes on in that movie, it's possible. I tend to agree with you guys. I think it's they're definitely going to have a place that they go to. But look, even in the Avengers, for the Avengers, they have their own place the compound that they that they have so i th th a compound a place that they have to go is absolutely going to have it's just a matter of where a big public place I t but probably not uh especially because of all the bombings and everything that happened in batman v superman why well, yeah, let's just go underground so it probably makes more sense to not put a public yeah they don't want dead shot knowing where batman lives that's a good point. all right definitely all not. right guys that'll do it for us for this installment of collider movie talk thank you so much for joining us listen don't forget the most important part of our show is not what we have to say it's what you have to say you guys carry on the conversation jump into the comments section below and leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discussed here today we read just about all of them so jump on in and add your two cents i want to thank the people sitting at the table with me first of all sitting my left mr john schnepp schnepp where can people find you online you guys can find me on twitter and instagram just at john schnepp and this weekend long beach comic con i've got a booth there with holly come on down get some of our cool death of superman lives film if you haven't seen it yet we're also doing a panel on saturday night uh it's a heroes panel 
Campia, you're going to be there? Yep. If he, if he can be there, there's a lot of people. Burnett, all the Heroes people will be there. Anybody else from uh, the Collider family, if they're going to be there, hopefully we might have some surprise guests. Definitely come down to Long Beach Comic Con. And to my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, Twitter and Instagram, like John mentioned before, Jedi Council will be up a little later today. And if you did, if you watched the team match in the Schmodown on Tuesday, both Finstock and Josh McCuga had a big problem with the rules. They're going to be protesting the entire match tonight on the Schmo <laughs> Show. So make sure you check out the Schmoes tonight live, 7 to 9 p.m. on the Schmoes Channel. Sitting at the end, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, love your hair today, by oh, the way. Where you. can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Thursday, guys. And of course, sitting back there, Miss Wendy Lee Zaney. Mm -hmm. Where can people find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Canby. Of course, John Schnepp and I have a show on Comic-Con HQ called Film HQ airs every Saturday. Make sure you head on over to www.comic-conhq to sign up for that trial today. And of course, you can catch me on the Schmodown tomorrow night with the judges with Freddie Prince Jr. on Jedi Council later, on Heroes, wherever. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia, and for Collider Movie Talk, until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.